what's up guys today i want to do a quick shout out to people on this team i'm on we are, we're all content creators on twitch and youtube and we support each other on there so i'm gonna do a shout out to team ignition and the first shout out i want to give is to ignition ziggy which is twitchtv.ignitionziggy which i'll put the links down below so you guys can check them out next is bidwell blake i the patriot ttv cheesy 200 lucid loki down underscore dk game trenches gagey rondo all xw aiden yamate minor hd sinfinity slays and rexki i'd also like to shout out l bell asmr and zzz ziggy asmr which i'll put them them down below too uh i the patriot also has a youtube as well as link x on youtube J Pars, Tasty underscore Killin, Simmons with an X for no, I think. It's S I M M X N S, and King Cloud. You guys should also check out Roman Gov, who does music on Spotify. Also, if you haven't seen part one of this yet, I'll put the link down below, but. You might want to watch that first, or you might get confused with uh, this video. Because we're on chapter 4. June 1999. Our group went to the Hearst. The Hearst was a nickname for Hearst Movie Theater, which was a couple miles from where I lived. Scotty and Casey had girlfriends that they had just started dating the first week of summer. Casey was 19, which was a couple years older than us. His girlfriend was 17. Scotty's girlfriend, Phoebe, drove Scotty, Devin, and me. Casey drove his girlfriend, Kelly, Marcos, and Brad. Phoebe looked like she was a mix between Asian and Caucasian. She was five feet, tan skin, dark hair, and very skinny. Kelly was a curvy red head with a round face and a tiny nose. She was about six feet tall. Phoebe wore a tight white shirt with the word fun printed on it and had black denim shorts and sandals on. Kelly was wearing a gray hoodie, blue jeans, and gym shoes. I didn't have a girlfriend yet. When you get bullied as much as I did by jocks, school isn't exactly the most ideal place to be social. Scotty met Phoebe in chemistry. He helped her with her chemistry homework. Using his witty observations to teach her, he eventually asked her out. Although I've only seen them together a few times, I noticed that Phoebe did not like being kissed or held in public. Scotty would sneak up behind her in the hall and hug her from behind, and she would scream and kick and then shout at him. He claims they made out when it was just the two of them alone. Casey met Kelly at Ed G's Steak Factory, which was a burger joint down the street from Borden High. She was a waitress there. When she gave him the check, she also slipped him her number. Kelly was cool. She listened to a lot of the same music we listened to. She was an Irish Southern style girl with an attitude. We got tickets to see Teaching Mrs. Tingle. It felt like the appropriate movie to see at the time. 
Teenagers who deal with an authority figure that catches them with a cheat sheet stolen by a bad boy cliché. It was pretty girly, but the initial concept was funny. Katie Holmes wasn't bad looking either. Devin walked over near the screen and sat down on the floor. He spread his legs and started stretching. What are you doing, Dev? I asked. The theater was pretty empty at the time. We were 15 minutes early. Sitting in chairs that are not that comfortable for an hour and a half? I'm going to need to stretch and shake off some energy. Then he stood up and started running around, up and down the steps, in the aisle. It was a fairly big theater with red walls and seats, and the steps were red carpet. It was quite a circular room, but I suppose that was to enhance the sound quality. Devin Jeffries was an interesting kid. He seemed to have numerous amounts of plaid, pa plaid pants. He was wearing a Just Do It shirt that day. If I didn't get to know him more, I would call him a poser for wearing a corporate shirt and calling himself a punker. Yet I knew he wore it just because it said Just Do It. He was always so full of energy and made us laugh. Casey and Kelly sat away from the group and back. Scotty and Phoebe also picked a row that was away from the group. Brad and Marcos went back and forth to get us all drinks and snacks. We gave them money, of course. All three of us sat a seat apart from each other. More people started coming in and filling the seats. As Devin would maneuver past them, the lights went dark, and then Devil, Devin stumbled on his way up and face-planted into the next step as everyone quietly laughed. He got up, walked down, and sat one seat over to my left as the movie started. I looked back and noticed Scotty put his arm around Phoebe. She proceeded to grab his arm and place it in his lap so he tried to hold her hand. She shook him off and whispered loudly, Stop! At, the same, at that time, I didn't know much about relationships, but I knew something was not right with that one. Kelly grabbed Casey's arm and rested her head on his shoulder. One of these things is not like the other. The credits started rolling at the end. Devin got up and shouted, Let's go give Mrs. Vader a piece of our minds. Mrs. Vader was a nickname we gave for Mrs. Vickner, our history teacher. She was a tall woman in her mid-fifties with long black hair. She always wore these long gray dresses and would stop to breathe deeply whenever she was about to lose her temper. Hence why we gave her the nickname. Fuck that, let's go to Mather's house and call him out, I replied. Michael Mathers was the dean of our school. He pissed me off for one reason. Whenever one of the jocks got in trouble, they would leave his office laughing and shaking his hand. Seriously, you're going to tell me you're not condoning abusive behavior when you're acting like that? Before summer started, I was eating lunch in the cafeteria, minding my own business, when I felt something hit the back of my head. I rubbed my head and searched, but I couldn't find anything because it rolled away. I looked up and noticed the people in front of me were getting pinged, so they moved down. Finally, I turned around and caught one. It was a quarter. Mike Cass and Roger Wood were looking in my direction and laughing with their friends. So I got up and handed them their quarter back. Then Roger stood up and grabbed me from behind. 
Mike took the quarters from his pocket and shoved them into my mouth. So I spat them in his face. Then he punched me in the gut. According to the dean, I approached them. There was no other altercation. Yes, I realize I should have just dealt with it. But there is only so much a guy can take. That is why I hated that dean. We all drove to Ed G's afterward to get some burgers. The waitress came over. She was a five foot blonde with a beautiful smile and blue eyes. She looked good in front and back in her white button down shirt and black mini skirt. Then Devin shouted, Bulbs! Casey tapped his arm. Not here, man. Kelly works here. Hi, my name is Lacey. I'll be your server today. What can I get you guys to drink? Lacey and Casey, just so you don't think we're calling you, can we call you L? Devin asked. Lacey laughed. Sure. We ordered our drinks and Lacey walked away. Dude, she is hot, I blurted out. You should ask her out, man, Casey said as he laughed. Now I think it'd be weird having more than one waitress from the same place in a group. Plus she's taken, Kelly said with a smirk. Ah well, Scotty tried to put his arm around Phoebe again. God, seriously, stop. Why? I don't get it. I'm just trying to be closer to you. I just feel awkward, okay? I'm sorry if it was just us. It would be different. Why, though? She rolled her eyes. I just feel strange when we get close with other people around. It's like we're putting on a show. To get an accurate description of how we were sitting in this square table, picture directions on a compass from bird's eye view. There are two seats per side. Casey and Kelly on the south end. Devin and I on the north end. Scott and Phoebe were on the west end. And Bradley and Marcos were on the east end. It got awkward and quiet until Mike Cass and four guys from the football team walked in. Oh my god, Phoebe Adams is hanging with the loser crew. This is pathetic, just come sit with us. I know you want this. Phoebe rolled her eyes and looked to the ground. Fuck off, Cass, Scotty shouted. Mike stepped towards Scotty, so Phoebe got up. Just stop, please go, sit. Mike and his teammates sat down at the table behind us. That guy is such a prick, Devin said, as he leaned towards me. I bet he has some kind of secret, like he's in love with one of his teammates and is afraid to come out or something, I said. Either that or he's having an affair with one of them and he'll, he's afraid he'll lose them. If he stops this little act, I said. We laughed and cracked on him for a few minutes until our drinks came. We ordered our food and then sat there looking around. There was a plaque of Ed G on the wall in a chef's hat holding a butcher's knife, cutting meat while smiling at the camera. You know, there's something very odd about a picture of a man named Ed G smiling with a butcher knife in his hand, Devin said. I looked around. It was a nice place. There was a navy blue carpet with white painted brick walls, navy blue tables with white chairs, a navy blue diner counter on the left wall that curved around in the corner. Behind the cash register, they had edgy flasks for sale. They had a liquor license, but weren't we weren't old enough to drink yet, obviously. Our 
Our food came out 20 minutes later. Their burgers were quite tasty. I wasn't a fan of their french fries though. They made steak fries. I know it may sound gross to some people, but I have always been partial to the fries at McDonald's. Anyone want my pickle? Phoebe asked. I did not know you had a pickle, Phoebe. Maybe Scotty wants to touch it. Devin replied. Phoebe rolled her eyes. Dude, shut up, Scotty said. I'm sorry, I'm just goofing around, Phoebe. We ate for about a half hour, and then right when everyone was halfway finished, Mike started throwing tater tots at my head. I rolled my eyes and waved my hand in back of me to catch them or dodge them, when one bounced off into Casey's pop. Casey looked at Kelly, then looked at me, then looked around at the room and everyone watching. Ah, oh, hell. Casey scooted out of his chair and stood up as Lacey walked over. Did someone call me? No, not you. Look, if someone doesn't kick them out, I'm going to kick their asses. He shouted with his hoarse voice. Casey was a big guy. He had quite a bit more muscle mass than the rest of us. Kelly stood up and put her arm in front of him. Baby, don't. Not here. I'm not looking for a fight. I'm just looking for some decency. He barked back. Mike and his team stood up. You want a piece of me, bro? No, Lacey shouted. She put her arms out to block him. This guy's throwing tater tots at us. He's been harassing my cousin and his friends every freaking week. The manager walked out. Her name tag read, read Regina. She was a short, chubby black woman with dark, shoulder-length hair. All right, all right, I'm about to throw both y'all out. Ask them. Casey pointed to the table on the left. Hell, check your cameras. I'm just trying to finish my meal, but we're being pelted by this clown. Mike jolts towards Casey as Regina points at him. Get your team and get out. That's it. What? He's the one that threatened to kick my ass. Out, she snapped. Mike and his team walked towards the door. I'll be waiting out here for you, bro. Now who's the one giving threats, boy? I better see you drive off or I'm calling the police. Move. She replied. My dad's a cop. They won't touch me, Mike said with a smirk. Regina put a hand on her hip. So was my husband. You sure you want to piss him off? Then they walked out of the diner and peeled out of the parking lot. Thanks. I'm sorry. I just had to do something. Don't thank me. Only reason you punks out, out, out there with them is I don't want anybody flying through my window. Finish your food and go. Not a smart idea. To piss your girl's boss off. She snapped back at him. So we finished our food quiet, quietly and left. Casey brought Kelly to listen in at practice the next week. Scotty hadn't been able to reach Phoebe since that day at Ed G's. You could tell he was pissed. I started to feel that uncomfortable feeling that I got when my dad died watching my mom cry. On the bright side, Scotty finished the lyrics to the songs we were working on. We also came up with a name, a new band name, Dirty Apple. We named it that for two reasons. One, the tree of knowledge. We're imperfect humans, and that's kind of what the tree represents 
The other reason was from something I said about this teacher I had a thing for, Miss Miller. I'd like to take a bite out of that apple. Everyone got a kick out of that, so we stuck with it. Scotty called one of the songs we wrote Unmasked. The lyrics in the chorus went like this. I can't find no lock and key. I just want to set you free. Words of fraud that feel like lies. Won't you take off your disguise? Working for the CIA. I won't see you another day. Got me trapped now, let's be fair. Take it off, what's under there? <laughs> Even though it obviously sounded like a song about a relationship, I took it as a song about lies that we are fed by people in general and how everyone has secrets hidden, whether they are corrupt or not. The other song was called Failure. Don't understand, I raise my hand. You ignore me like you don't see in the water. I am sinking. You just sit there, keep on blinking. No time for me. It becomes clear you are the one who has failed here. It was a song about teachers come across who blame the students who are trying to reach out for their own failure. It was a powerful message that needed to be said in, in some situations, especially when it involves a teen's life. The blame should be shared. Our minds were messed up enough as it was. It's important to take the initiative and discuss these things. Miscommunication can lead to confusion, which leads to danger in the minds of adolescents. We all sat outside. Devin dug out the tiny wooden box that had his weed and pipe from the ditch in the corner of Scotty's house. There were a couple fences around the patio so no neighbors could see. We all just stared out and watched the sunset. The orange glow saturated the sky. I don't pay much attention to the nature of the sky, but I always appreciated the glow of that sky during sunset. Casey kissed the top of Kelly's head and held her. Scotty seemed far away, lost in thought. Devin got up and pounced on Scotty, hugging him tight. I still love you, buddy. Okay, let go, damn it, Scotty said while fighting to breathe. Beauty can bring people together sometimes. I got off the bed of the truck that night as Casey drove away. I started wa walking up my driveway when I heard somebody call. Hey, come here for a second. I need to talk to you. My neighbor, who was two houses down, was out on his front, front porch I reluctantly walked over to him. He was an old man in his late 70s wearing a green sweater vest with a blue button-down shirt under it. He had spots all over his face and he was nearly bald on top, aside from a few strands of hair. I kept my distance from his porch as he got up and walked towards me. That shirt you're wearing, you designed that? Uh, yeah. I said and I stepped back. It had an anarchy symbol on the shirt. I realized the whole anarchy thing is kind of stupid, but to me it was like saying, fuck your bullshit. I live the way I want to. That's not what the symbol itself represents, but it's like a middle finger to any figure of authority. You know the devil's laughing at you. Okay... He took a few steps closer to me, and for some reason I stood there and didn't walk away. Look, just pray with me for a second. As he grabbed my shoulder, I shook his hand off. Then he grabbed both of my shoulders with his hands. Dear Lord, 
we beg of your forgiveness. Get the fuck off me. I'm just trying to pray with you, son. I didn't say you could touch me. Don't call me son. You are not my father. My father died. Don't you ever call me son. I yelled as I ran back home. Let's get one thing straight. I believe in Jesus. I like his story. He was a good guy. That old man might have been harmless, but crazy things can happen at night. You never know. People shouldn't be grabbing on your shoulders like that. I also don't think it's a sin to challenge authority with an anarchy sign. I'm not attacking anyone. I just have my own perspective. I went in the house, made myself a turkey sandwich, and turned on the TV. I flipped to Cartoon Network and started watching Johnny Bravo. He was always after the ladies. When you look at him and think about it, he could be related to Beavis from Beavis and Butthead. A dude with a big head and blonde hair that's always looking to score. Cartoons certainly have changed since then. It feels like so many people were offended by anything we remotely found funny as kids and decided we need to be stricter. Sure, there are still cartoons that are immature and goofy, but it feels like we are trying way too hard. I know I have grown and lost the innocence these children experience when we watch these shows, yet a little borderline humor here and there never hurt anyone. I hope we don't lose that sense of humor completely as time grows. The next day I woke up and saw Dr. Giles making breakfast in the kitchen. Mom was still in bed. Aren't you supposed to be at work, I asked. Your mother and I pulled some strings and got the day off. I'm spending the day with your mother. We're going out to lunch if you'd like to join us. No thanks. I poured myself a bowl of Cheerios and sat down to eat. I made you eggs and bacon. I usually make my own breakfast in the morning. Yeah, but I'd hate for this food to go to waste. Just put it on a plate in the fridge. One of us will eat it later. Yeah, but this is fresh bacon and eggs. They don't taste good reheated. I just woke up and felt like this guy was trying to shove his food down my throat. I stared at him for a second. No, thanks. I said slowly. I don't know if he was trying to get on my good side, but if that was the case, he needed a new strategy. Mom, Dr. Giles, and I were eating spaghetti that night when we heard a knock at the door. My mom opened it. It was my brother with a blonde-haired girl wearing a leopard print sweater. Oh, Mom, what are you doing home? I had the day off. Who's this? Uh, well, Mom. This is Stephanie. My wife. <laughs> Chapter 5 What? Are you kidding me? Where'd you meet this girl? When did you meet this girl? A year ago. A year ago? You barely know this girl. The veins were starting to pop out of Mom's neck. I'm in love, Mom. It was the right thing to do. Mom gasped. Oh my God, you're not pregnant, are you? No, she shouted back. Kurt put his arm around Stephanie. We love each other, Mom. You felt it was time. Stephanie put her hand on his chest. Well, that's wonderful, but usually marriage is about being with someone for more than just a year and knowing they are the one. Baby, maybe we should go, Stephanie said. She pressed against him in hopes he'd 
start walking. Wait, I came here to see if Calvin wants to come hang out and eat with us. I'll buy him some dessert. Oh, so you don't want to spend time with your mother? Fine. I need a drink. Calvin, your brother wants you, Mom said as she walked away. I got into Stephanie's car as we drove off. Stephanie wasn't bad looking. She had short blonde hair above her ears. She was around five feet, quite skinny, but she had a nice rag. I wouldn't mind being that sweater or the black pants that she was wearing. She had a nice looking figure. Her voice was raspy. It was hot out that night, so she took off her sweater and threw it in the back seat. She was wearing a cheap, cheap, uh, cheap, cheap, cheap shirt underneath. We drove off to Ed G's and went inside. Luckily, Cass was not there that night. We sat down and then Kelly walked over to us. Hey, Cal, how are you? Okay, you? Good, just b been busy today. The place was pretty packed that night. She was surprisingly energetic considering how busy they seemed to be. Cool. This is my brother Kurt and his uh, wife. It felt so awkward saying that. It was, I was cool with it, but it was hard to get used to. Hey, Kurt said. As Stephanie smiled and waved. Cool. I'm Kelly, his bass player's girlfriend. What can I get you guys? I ordered their or Oreo pie and a soda. Stephanie and Kurt ordered two G-Burger meals with fries and two sodas. G-Burgers were basically two-pound burgers with bacon, cheese, lettuce, and the owner's special sauce. I never had that burger, but my brother loved them and wanted his wife to try one. They were so big he could have just shared one half with her. So your brother tells me you're in a band? Stephanie asked while stroking my brother's hair. Yeah, we call ourselves Dirty Apple. Just something we made up. That's a funny name. Yeah, well we took the idea of the tree from the tree of knowledge and how people give apples to their teachers. A couple of us had a crush on our teacher, Mrs. Miller. She must be new. She wasn't there when I was there, Kurt replied. So have you guys played any shows yet? Stephanie asked. No, we're just starting out. We're just starting to get our songs down now. We're not ready yet. We didn't sound bad, but we definitely weren't ready to show the world or the town our sound yet. Then Kelly came with our drinks. So how did you guys meet? I asked. At one of their shows in Vegas, we met outside the score. The score is a place that's part nightclub and part casino. We talked for a few minutes after, sh after the show, and then I thought he was cute, so I asked him out. Steph said, then I said, then I said, you really can get lucky in this place, Kurt replied. She laughed and put her head on his shoulder. I live in her apartment now. That's cool. So are you working right now, Stephanie, or? Yeah, I'm a waitress, she said as she looked at my brother and then looked down. When she paused, I got the feeling she didn't want to tell me what she really did. That was okay with me. I don't ask questions if it seems like they don't want to provide much info. Dig up a graveyard and the results may be scary. So, do you have a girlfriend? Steph asked me as I rolled my eyes. Nah. I don't really talk to people much outside my band and family. 
He was like me in grade school. I'd come home, play Nintendo. The only difference is, I wasn't in a band till I was 18. Kurt was, Kurt was right, yet he was more, much more outgoing than I could ever be. Sounds boring, Stephanie said as she sighed. Well, let me ask you a question, babe. Would you rather reach out to people who most likely grab that hand and kick you in the gut? Or would you rather go through your daily life until someone reaches out their hand to help you out and then help you up? Well, how do you know that person extending their hand won't kick you? Well, the point is, don't leave yourself open to attack. In high school, trust is a scary thing. Kurt said as he sighed and kissed Stephanie on the side of her head. Kelly handed me my Oreo pie a few minutes later. Then a few minutes later, a little boy wandered over and tried to grab my pie off the table. His parents weren't even paying attention. They were busy looking at their daughter, who looked like she was about five or six little boy had a pudgy face and dark hair. His cheeks were bright red. I moved my plate away from his reach, so he jumped on my chair, grabbed my arm with one hand, and smashed into the pie with his other hand. He fell back before I could catch him, but turned in time to land on his hands. Then he started eating the cake from his hand on the floor. My brother and I started cracking up. Ah, oh, what the fuck? Stephanie shouted. Then the boy's parents turned to see him on the floor, and the father got up and grabbed him. Johnny, no, Icky. He sat the boy back down in the chair next to him. Nice parenting, Stephanie said. She scoffed. Jill, babe, no harm done. Unless you're my pie, I said as my brother and I laughed. Then Kelly walked over. Don't worry, I'll get you another pie. Get the kid one to go, I told her. Maybe the parents can use the pie to teach their kids some discipline. Stephanie snapped. Kurt put his forehead against the side of her head and kissed her. As she quietly made a shushing sound, or as he quietly made a shushing sound in her ear. On the ride home, Stephanie was still complaining about the kid. I began to think that this girl had some kind of issues. Then it made me wonder what she was hiding. I didn't ask her, but I was still curious. The next day at practice, we all sat around for a few minutes waiting for Devin while he smoked outside. Kelly wasn't there that day because she had to work. It was just the band, Bradley, and Marcos. Scotty was still looking pretty down. Still haven't heard from her, man? I asked. Scotty shook his head. I looked down at his feet while he sat down. Then he looked down at his feet while he sat down, resting his arms on his knees. I've tried calling, I've emailed, left voicemails, text messages, and last night, I waited for her when her parents told me she was out. She never came home. It was obvious that this had become somewhat of an obsession of his. At that point in time, I never had a girlfriend, but I'm pretty sure I wouldn't cross over that line from piss off to obsession. It was silent for a few minutes. Marcos brought us some soda cans from the fridge. Marcos was an interesting kid. He never really said much. Brad did most of the talking for him. Who wants to watch South Park after you guys practice tonight? Bradley asked. I shrugged. Okay. Okay, Scotty said apathetically. Casey just sat there messing with his bass. I still wasn't used to Brad, and I found him kind of annoying, but the more we hung out, 
the cooler he became. Levanta! Devin shouted as he charged in past us and plopped onto his stool. He started thumping his foot on his kick drum, grabbed his drumsticks, and started warming up. Casey and I plugged in and got ready. A few minutes later, after we started, Scotty seemed to be taking out his aggression and frustration through the music. He was jumping from wall to wall, and he was even spitting in uh, Bradley and Marcos' face. He did that to us eventually. It made you worry about him, but at the same time, it was extremely funny. This is the best weapon Uncle Jared was referring to. Scotty was firing off emotional energy bullets. Luckily, they were blanks. Jeez, you Dilophosaurus. What are you trying to do, blind us? Bradley squeaked as he wiped his cheek. Excuse me while I go wash my face. And he got up and walked out to the bathroom. I have survived your venomous attack, villain. You are no match for my fortress of drums, Devin shouted in a poor southern accent as he rattled his cymbal. <laughs> then we all went into the lounge in Scotty's basement, where we watched South Park on TV. I opened the fridge in the corner of the room to grab another can of soda. Anyone else want one? Marcos and I will have one, Bradley replied. I turned to them. One? You're going to share it? No, one of each, he shouted. I handed them their cans, went back to grab mine, and sat down. Scotty went back to his brooding position from the beginning of practice. While we watched, we comment here and there. Hey, look, Marcos, you're on TV, Casey grunted as he pointed to Cartman. We all laughed as Marcos got up and tried to hit Casey, but Casey grabbed Marcos' wrists. Marcos would try and kick him in the nuts, so Casey quickly got up and swept Marcos' leg and swung him down onto the couch by his wrists with the momentum. Then Casey bent and twisted his wrists until Marcos yelled, Ah, ah, okay, stop, stop. That was the first time I ever heard Marcos talk. He had a less annoying pre-pubescent voice with a slight lisp. His voice was a tad deeper than Bradley's. Ah, ah, stop. Scotty pulled out his phone and started texting Phoebe. Dude, give me that, Devin said. And actually, it's more. Dude, give me that, as he snatched Scotty's phone out of his hands. What the fuck? Give it back. Devin jumped behind the couch and raised his arm. Scotty chased Devin around the room until he finally grabbed Devin's arm. Devin started shouting really loud and dropped to his knee. As he grabbed his back with his free arm and dropped the phone lightly with his other arm. What'd you do to him? Nothing. I barely got a hold of his arm. Scotty replied. I it's nothing. You're just a fucking cramp, Devin said as he got back to his feet. Devin hunched over and stumbled to the bathroom, then closed the door. There's a sight to see, a man in physical pain who was wrestling with a man dealing with emotional pain. Some say that they'd trade emotional pain for the physical any day. What I don't get about that argument is the physical pain can make you feel emotional. So you'd be trading it to get rid of it only to get it back again. If you traded in your emotional pain to feel completely numb inside and out, that's a different story. We all have that ball and chain we drag with us. We just need to remember. Our hearts and, mi and our minds are the key to unlocking the freedom we need to continue on. Jeez.
chapter six. One year later, we played our first gig. It was at this rundown bowling alley called Pin for the Win. It smelled like smoke, sweat, and ass. Devin and Casey rode in the truck with Devin's drum set. Scotty's friend Ken picked Scotty, Brad, Marcos, and me up, and we rode with him in his station wagon. Moments after we arrived, Kelly and a couple of her friends came in. One was a curvy redhead who wore glasses, and the other was a skinny blonde who looked extremely pale and wore goth-style clothes. A few of Scotty's friends came to watch us play. Excluding the bowlers, about ten people were in that crowd. Everyone was complaining about how it smelled like toilets that were exploding in the bathroom or something. We made it the be we made the best of it, but it was pretty disgusting. We opened with a couple of our songs and then played some covers. By the end of our set, Kelly's friends have gone outside, and Scotty's friends followed. Ken stayed, though. Ken was a tall, muscular African guy who was apparently on our high school wrestling team. I wasn't a fan of his at first because I associated any athletes with jocks, and I hated the way jocks treated me. Ken was cool, though. He was quiet, but he was a nice guy. Three girls came to the stage. One shouted, Boo! Play some Backstreet Boys! Yeah, because the Backstreet Boys were a really great punk band, Scotty replied in his sarcastic tone. As a joke, I would start playing Larger Than Life on guitar. The guys looked at me like they were worried that I was actually going to play the whole song. One of the girls was a short, pale, skinned, brown-haired girl who wore glasses and an Aero Pro style shirt. We met eyes. It was a nice moment. She had a great smile. After the set, we sat in the lounge, watching the bowlers for a while and talked. The Aero Postel girl walked over to me and brought me a soda. Thanks. I'm, uh, Calvin. I'm Sarah. Nice. So, did you have fun? Yeah, I'm not very good at the whole bowling thing, but you guys sounded good. Well, we're no, uh, Backstreet Boys. I smiled as she laughed. We talked for a while before we loaded up the drums in Casey's truck and put our gear away. I found she went to Hunter High, which was 20 minutes away from our high school. We were the same age, only she was a couple months younger than me. I sat on the curb as she sat beside me in the parking lot for a bit, and we hung out. Sarah moved closer to me. Then we looked up at the stars. You ever wish you could be the stars? Eh, stars fade. I'd rather be the sun. Night or day, we will always see the light of the sun. Even when the sun goes down, we see it when the moon shines. Yeah, the sun is a star, though, she replied. You don't see the rest of these all the time, though. It doesn't matter how gloomy it is. The sun is always there. I said. So, do you have any plans for after high school? Well, the band is the plan. But if that doesn't work out, something in music, I guess. That's cool. Why'd you guys name your band Dirty Apple? I laughed. <laughs> I only told her the part about the tree of good and evil, because I felt the teacher thing was a bit too perverted for this conversation. Do you guys have any merch or CDs yet? No, we actually just started. This is our first gig. Oh wow, your parents didn't come out for support? 
No, my mom's a nurse at the hospital down the road, and uh, my dad. I looked down at my feet. Well, my dad died. He was a trucker and got into an accident while driving drunk. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. Yeah, it hasn't been easy, but it's all right. Then Ken told us we had to go. We said our goodbyes, exchanged numbers, and then we hugged. We stared at each other for a moment, then I got in, into the car, looked out the window at her, and we drove away. Sarah called the next day. We agreed to meet at the local park and have lunch. We both packed our own lunch, but I brought an extra bag put it in my book bag, and put it in my book bag, in case she wanted any of it. I decided to bring a blanket for us to lie on, since it was practically a picnic. I walked to Royal Park, wearing black jeans and a black shirt. Nothing special. That's as nice as you'll get me a dress for a date. When I got there, she was wearing, waiting on the bench. It was under an oak tree. It was a warm day. She was wearing a black shirt and blue jeans. Her hair was a little messy, but when you're walking, shit happens. Hey, I said. Hi. Oh, cool. You brought a bri blanket. She smiled. Then we got up and walked towards the open grass. Sometimes kids would play soccer there. But here it didn't happen often. Looking back to the left of the bench, uh, looking uh, looking back to the left of the bench we came from, is a play area with the swing sets and monkey bars. I placed the blanket down as we took our seats, and I pulled the extra bag out of my book bag. I brought an extra bag in case you wanted anything else. Oh, thank you. That's sweet of you. I pulled the food out of the bag. I've got snack-sized Lay's potato chips, a ham sandwich, some Reese's peanut butter cups, and I know you brought your own drink, but I figured you'd want a soda, or if you want a soda or diet soda, here you go. Take your pick. I brought my bottled water. I'll take a Reese's, though. Thank you. She took the Reese's and pulled the Tupperware container out of her bag. She opened the lid and revealed her chicken salad with bacon, lettuce, and tomato. Then she pulled out a Ziploc bag with apple slices and the tiny Tupperware container with peanut butter inside. Wow, your lunch looks a whole lot healthier than mine, I said. She giggled. Well, plus I'm eating your Reese's, so that kind of defeats the whole, like, healthy thing. I handed her some napkins from my bag as we started to eat. So, you know about my parents. What do your parents do? She chewed her food and then answered. My mom stays home and looks after my little brother. My dad is a chef at Carlito's. My mom loves that place. Her and her boyfriend go there all the time. Do you have uh, any brothers or sisters, she asked? Yeah, my brother Kurt. He's five years older than me. He's on tour with his band. What's the name of his band? Cheap, Cheap, Cheap. It's a reference to Mario Brothers. Oh, that's cute. So you take after your brother with the whole music thing? Actually, we started playing at the same time. Our uncle gave us a guitar a few years ago, and we've been playing ever since. From what I heard, you sounded pretty good. There was something about that moment. But just her smile. The way the air ran through her hair. The way the light hit her face was beautiful. Excuse me for being mushy, 
But you saw this kind of stuff is going to happen from the beginning. <laughs> I smiled longer in that moment than I think I've ever smiled. Since before my dad died. So, how old is your little bro? He's nine. His name is Leo. He's a handful. It's actually funny you mention Mario because he loves playing Mario Kart 64. I've never actually played anything but Super Mario Brothers on the original Nintendo f from the 80s. She gasped. You have got to come over one day and play it with us. When? I don't know. How about tomorrow? Okay. I shrugged. I was a little nervous about going to her house and meeting her mom. But I was really into this girl. We talked for a couple hours and then decided to get moving. We cleaned up our area and rolled the blanket back up. I'll call you tomorrow and let you know what time. Okay. Then we hugged and waved to each other as we parted ways. That night I had trouble sleeping. This was a new th experience for me. I kept thinking about her smile and wondering how things would be around her family. For once, I felt like I had something that I really didn't want to lose. I've seen Scotty's relationship and all the drama. I wondered if I, this would be any different. How could something so tranquil, tranquil and beautiful cause the pain you could see in his eyes. The next morning I got up and made myself cereal. Then I took a shower and got dressed. Normally I don't dress to impress, but I thought I'd wear the button-down plaid collar shirt my mom raved about. I played my guitar for a bit until I heard the phone ring. I rushed over and picked it up. Hello? Hi, uh, is this Calvin? Yeah. This is Sarah. Listen, I don't want to make you nervous, but my mom wants to know if you'd like to have dinner with us tonight. We can play Mario Kart with Leo before we eat. Sure. I'm sorry, my mom just really wants to get to know who I'm hanging out with. It's okay. So we'll pick you up around four? She asked. Okay. Bye. My heart started racing. I kept telling myself to calm down and stop acting like Scotty. I decided to play Nintendo for a while. That's all I have to do, I said. I just have to get through the end of the level, which in this case could be dinner, before time runs out. It's a good thing her house didn't have any lava pits, 